Uh, I've been kind of told that my talk's a little bit different. Um, it really hasn't been done before. I'm not going to talk a lot about um, any kind of fundamental technology. I'm going to talk about what we've done to kind of bring that technology in. Um, like Will said, I, I work at AbbVie. I feel like sometimes I still have to say this because we split off in 2013, but hopefully you know, six, late, six years later, people have figured out um, who we are. We're in North Chicago. Um, this is just a nice overhead site um, photo. Um, the process group is also in North Chicago. And it, it is not the north part of Chicago. It's actually like an hour north of Chicago. It's its own little city. Um, but it's up against Lake, Lake Michigan. It's a uh, pretty view, and I've been there since 2013. Automation at Abvi has actually um, been around in some form um, for several decades, actually. But in 2013, we've actually decided to kind of spearhead an initiative um, to really see where we can start to leverage what we already know um, from historical aspect, but also look at what's out there that we can bring in, whether it's a, a technology company or some other pharma that has done something. We don't want to reinvent the wheel here, um, but what can we do um, to push this forward and maximize um, the utilization of automation? Um, the talk is kind of reaction-centric, um, but really all this will also be applied at AVI to crystallizations and, and uh, workup processes. But to lay the, the, the foundation for this um, we kind of looked at this from a 30,000 foot level. Um, what would it really do for us? Um, we need to, um, the, the finite resource that we all have in common is time. Um, and that's what we really were thinking that this was going to, um, to aid in the, the, the appropriate use and efficient use of that time. Um, so it's, it's we really gonna kind of view it, sorry, as a, uh, back right, there we go. Um, as just another tool in our toolbox. Um, automation does not solve every problem. Um, but how can it make us do um, more with what we already have? So in looking at process chemistry, we kind of identified uh, these key parts of, of the process. Um, early on, we identified the transformation we want to make. Um, from there, we're able to distinguish the hits we get from like large-scale screening. Um, and as we kind of start to refine the process, looking at identifying the nominal conditions, um, eventually we need to kind of have a really good in-depth understanding of the process um, before ultimately delivering um, on a larger scale, usually in our case to support um, clinical trials and eventually a commercialized process. Um, so like I said, we, we started this initiative in 2013, like a, a more spearheaded focus, um, but we couldn't just do it in one big group. Um, we actually ended up dividing ourselves into subgroups um, that I've listed here. Um, the first one is, is we call HTE, high throughput experimentation. Uh, this is, you know, there's a minimum kind of benchmark where we're looking at probably 24 or, or more reactions. So this is your 96 well plate screens um, or, or larger. And, and an attempt not to just do things um, in a uh, one factor at a time approach. You can do two dimensional arrays um, really well with high throughput screening. Um, the idea here is to look at lots of different transformations or lots of different ways to do a single transformation um, that you just wouldn't really simply have the time to do iteratively or one at a time. Um, and again, like we're also applying this to identifying solubility properties of, of molecules for crystallizations, um, but also to look at um, polymorph screening or other solid state parameters. Um, the group I primar primarily work in is the MTE group, the medium throughput experimentation. So this is looking at um, a subset of reactions, probably 24 um, reactions at a time or less. Um, in this case, we're, we're starting to really hone in on the reaction conditions and uh, really kind of start to gain a little bit more understanding about what we're looking at long term. This is kind of the first point where we start to integrate some, some PAT. Um, it's just not really um, probable, or it's not, sorry, it's not really possible on the smaller scale just because of the volumes that we're looking at. But as we start to go to medium throughput, we're not as material poor. Um, we can do things on the, the hundreds of milligrams or gram scale. Um, the third one here is a custom automation group. So this group um, it's a smaller group, but mainly based with, of engineers that are there to tackle the kind of one-offs, the things you can't just buy off the shelf. Um, this group is really good at kind of bridging the gap between two pieces of technology that aren't meant to communicate, um, but they figure out great ways to break down the communication pathways to get these things to communicate either in feedback loops or in plotting data. Um, and the last group that I, I interact with the least but almost appreciate the most is the information management group. Um, we generate so much data um, that it, it, all, it all has to a, go somewhere um, and be interpreted. And especially when you've got different platforms that give you different types of information, or different formats of information, um, they're really working hard to get that into a kind of a seamless package to where 
the, the chemist or the person making the decisions can look at everything in one plane um, without having to deconvolute from different file formats or different types of data. Um, I just don't interact with them much because it's well outside my wheelhouse. So from, from bench to plant, um, the, the way we see this is when you're trying to get the initial hit, um, this is your, the HTE program. Oops, I keep pushing the back button. Um, so we're looking at you know, the, the, the low-hanging fruit, solvents, reagents, sometimes equivalents, um, sometimes uh, stoichiometric ratios or palladium ligand ra um, loading ratios for catalysis. Um, these things are done in, in, high, in high throughput fashion with in large plates. This is uh, not new technology. Um, but as we start to scale up the reaction, kind of try to get a more in-depth understanding or seeing you know, kind of the scaling effects, um, we do start to go to our kind of medium throughput arenas. And so um, here is an, an Amigo Chem system. It's able to do uh, 10 reactions in parallel um, for overhead stirring. That's a big one for us. Um, independent heating and cooling um, cells for that unit, and then obviously uh, we've got our, our Easy Max system here. We got two reactions in parallel. We can run um, different heating or cooling zones, uh, and eventually the goal really here is to um, get scalable data um, across all of these various platforms that then eventually lead us to our large scale deliveries in the pilot plant. So we've been growing in this, and that growth is really important, but it, it comes with a lot of growing pains um, and learnings associated with it that aren't always appreciated. Um, there is a multi-pronged effort to establish a new culture um, so that it's kind of built into the way we do things, um, not a, uh, a niche application up in some random corner in our, in our buildings. It, it's more uh, across the whole organization. Um, and I'm gonna kind of talk about some of the ways we've approached that um, and uh, kind of the success stories we've had around that. So, uh, you know, one of the things that I remember pretty vividly when I, when I first got my Easy Max was it came with this little uh, mouse pad. This is like no more round bottom flash or something like that. <laughs> uh, and it, it, it's, it's, it's exactly what they want, but um, you know, when we kind of compare the two against each other, an Easy Max versus a round bottom flask, uh, there are advantages, but there are disadvantages. There are things that the Easy Max can't do well yet. Um, and there's, there's, we actually have a dialogue going on to kind of solve some of those issues. Um, the, the one thing that really pops out to a lot of us is um, distillation. You, you, you still can't beat the, the road of that. And even in our, our kilo labs, you know, we do hundreds of liter scales still on, on a road of that. Um, it's fast, it's easy, it's reproducible. Um, and we can't, can't, haven't quite figured that out um, for the Easy Max. But we're, we're, I think we're gonna work on, on that. Uh, and the other thing too is um, when we start to, to get more data, uh, what do we do with it? Um, and what is it Where's the value in it? Uh, the thing is, everything we do um, can be a function of time. So we can, put, we can, if we want to, put everything on the same reaction coordinate. And I think that's something that was underappreciated until you start to see, I think Will mentioned this, when we start to see correlations that you would not have seen if you didn't overlay all the data together. And time is, is the, the universal independent variable. Um, and when you do that, things start to pop out at you. Uh, but the, the, the question I pose here, and it's something that took me off guard a couple weeks ago, um, actually, when I uh, have been kind of starting to go through this presentation with other people is uh, there's actually a group of people that think that too much data is a bad thing. And I think it, a lot of it stems from the uh, inability to analyze that data. I think we're, we're still working, at least at Abby, on how to interpret large data sets. Um, but <laughs> a quote that comes to mind is, you know, more money, more problems. Um, you know, Biggie said that, but it, it, it can be overwhelming. <laughs> And so you, you, want, you want to have a way that you can um, handle and interpret without being overwhelmed. Uh, and I think that there's some highlights here that I'm going to show that, that really kind of start to address that. Uh, and, and the big thing, the dri a lot of the drivers that we have for this is the reproducibility factor. Um, the data we're making five years from now, 10 years from now, is it still viable? Can we still use it? Is not necessarily just the format, but is the reliability, is the confidence in it, is it, is it there? And that's something that that really drives the investment side of why we, you know, and you'll see here why we've invested in some of the Metlitz Lido platform um, utility. And one of, the way, one of the ways we answered this question of, of where, where do we go with all this data and, or what do we need to do to approach doing chemistry in a new culture? And one of the ways we have identified, or one of the areas we identified is doing what we call high value experimentation. 
and it, it's it's you know a big word, but it's in a little bit subjective, but what we defined it for in this particular case is where data is driving the decision and you need to have a high degree of confidence. Um, in this case, when we're running front run, so you're trying to do a scale down of a large, large reaction, whether it's kilo scale or, or commercial scale, um, you, know, you, you need to have a high degree of accuracy, um, or high, sorry, a high degree of uh, confidence that what you're doing on a small scale is gonna be rep representative. Um, the next area, process justification. So when we're doing um, in lab experiments to then say, when we run this you know, across the world somewhere else, that we're gonna fit within the parameter zone that we've designed and it will be a, a, a safe and reproducible process that gets API um, at the quality we need. And the last one I listed here was stability. Again, another thing that happens on, on a reaction time coordinate that's, that where time is important and being able to log that data um, and then show that, again, you can reproduce that later on um, is, is, is very valuable to us. And, and moving forward, it's, it becomes obvious that the Metla Toledo um, ALR platform uh, solves a lot of these issues or addresses these particular types of experiments. So now I'll take you through um, a little short story of a, of a drug I worked on. Um, initially it was called ABT-493, uh, eventually become the, the drug Lecapavir. Um, it's an HCV drug. Um, it was around this time when I started this project in 2013 that I got my first EasyMax. Um, I say my first EasyMax because I'm kind of responsible for many. Um, but it was, it was really kind of a happenstance. Someone retired and, and never used it and I inherited it. Um, and I think it really changed how I approached process chemistry. And I'm gonna kinda dive into that a little bit and show you. But just looking at this molecule, it's, it is kind of a beast of a molecule. It's got an 18 member macrocyclic ring. Um, it's got two sets of gem difluorides and seven stereocenters. It, it was uh, kinda daunting when I first started this, but um, hopefully I'll, I'll kinda show you here how some of the, the chemistries we were able to accomplish with this um, really were enabled by um, using the, the EasyMax system. And the portion that I'll talk about today is actually this part of this micro microcyclic ring highlighted here in blue. Right, the, the first series of steps I worked on um, were actually pretty straightforward. Um, there were some s little nuances that, that made large scale manufacturing difficult. So the, the first stage is, a, is an SNAR with Bach hydroxyproline on this chloroquinoxalin. Sodium hydride um, was the only base we found that was able to do this reaction cleanly without elimination of HF. Um, and that was a big problem because when you eliminate HF from that, from that bond, you actually get um, a polymerization event that can happen. Uh, it turns black, it gets gummy. Um, so we, we found that sodium hydride was the, was the best base for this and you can charge it in, in poly bags to reactors. It's not ideal, but it can be done on scale. And we did this, I think around um, 70 or 75 kilos. Um, the subsequent step is, a, is an oxidation to form this epoxide. Um, the problem with this step is that you couldn't isolate the, um, the, the free acid. Unfortunately, under acidic conditions, this will cyclize actually onto the quinoxalin and form a uh, tricyclic um, intermediate, or sorry, a tricyclic impurity that was difficult to reject, um, and we had just attrition of product. Um, but we were able to actually isolate the, the sodium salt and te telescope that forward. Um, the subsequent step was uh, an opening of that epoxide to form the allylic alcohol. Again, uh, through extensive screening of bases, we found that TNO um, alcohol, or the, the conjugate base of that with uh, um, the potassium, uh, gave it the cleanest reaction profile. Um, from there, it's actually a pretty simple debocking and methyl ester formation all in one pot with methanol and HCl. Um, the biggest problem in, in most of the synthesis is that we're, during the opening of the epoxide, oops, in there, um, we actually get the, the cis alkene as well, and that was in a period that was difficult to reject. Um, in, in earlier iterations of the synthesis, we did a, um, a ring closing metathesis to form the macrocycle, and we knew that if we were gonna go down that line, um, large amounts of the cis isomer were gonna be difficult to reject. Um, so at this stage, uh, six to 7% was, was really on the high end, um, and we were looking at maybe doing chromatography to remove that, which again, long-term is, is not a viable option. Um, and it's a pretty modest yield over these, these uh, four steps. So we really needed to, to kind of sit down and identify, and this was, I think, 2014 when we, we kind of said we'd finished supply of phase two, and it was time to evaluate you know, a potential change at that point um, to make a long-term viable route. So the only other type of oxidation that seemed to work cleanly um, was a dihydroxylation, and I found that this um, can actually be telescoped in, in, the, in one pot with two steps. Um, to form the cyclic carbonate with CDI. 
Um, you get a 90% yield over two steps, um, nice white solid you isolate. Um, from there, I actually found that you were able to open up the cyclic carbonate to form the allylic carbonate um, in situ. A lot of people thought that this might not be very stable. We'd lose CO2 to get dimerization. And we do see small amounts of that, but I'm actually really surprised at how stable this intermediate is because then we're actually able to telescope the next step, um, an SNAR with Bach hydroxyproline um, to form this, uh, this intermediate here. The next step, again, is, is pretty simple. In this case, we're using, um, we, we break the salt um, and we use thionyl chloride and methanol that generate um, in situ dry HCl. Um, and then methyl ester formation in the same pot. So switching from the cyclic carbonate, or sw sorry, switching from the um, epoxide to the, the cyclic carbonate actually gave quite a yield boost. Um, and more importantly, um, we were actually able to double the throughput. So for HCV, this is a, a high volume drug um, and we needed to be able to, you know, reduce the number of batches in order to supply for drug product. Um, and this was a, a really key part of that. Um, the other interesting thing, and I wish I could dive more into this because it was really uh, fascinating at the time, was um, when you open the cyclic carbonate, you actually don't get much of the cis isomer. Um, a lot of times it was like the half percent level. Um, there's a really small energy difference between um, the elimination event between the epoxide and the cyclic carbonate. Um, and that wasn't really appreciated at first. We just thought it was a, a nuance of the chemistry, but we did some modeling. It was really kind of interesting. Um, but that was another key component that eliminated, or at least not, it uh, took chromatography off the table. So we didn't have to worry about that anymore. Um, the, the chemistry of the next couple, or so the, what I'll talk about in the next couple slides is gonna really focus on this um, two-step, one-pot procedure where I took the cyclic carbonate, um, opened, and then did the SNAR. So the pro when I started to do the process development for this, there are some um, key issues with the chemistry I needed to address. Um, the reaction was exothermic. Um, it was water sensitive. Um, not that you, didn't, you couldn't have water in there, but there was actually a very specific amount of water you needed to have in there. Um, the reaction is heterogeneous. You, you form the, the dipotassium salt of the Bach hydroxyproline, and that's very heterogeneous. The, and that um, intermediate is also reactive, and the reagents are reactive, and the whole thing also was done at minus 20, so it's slightly cryogenic. So what I needed, I needed some, some way to control the temperature internally. Um, I needed some way to control ramps for heating and cooling for crystallization. Um, I needed overhead mixing for the solids to mimic what we would see in large scale. I also needed to control dosing. Um, I needed something that would add in my sodium HMBS over a, a fixed period of time, and then I would al also be able to control the temperature during that. And lo and behold, the EasyMax is great for that. So in this particular setup, I had two dosing units. Um, one was actually just dosing dry THF. The other one was just dosing sodium HMBS in THF. Um, I got my, my graduate school balloon here. Um, this is just to keep the, the HMBS under some positive nitrogen, but this actually, the setup um, was very reproducible, um, and I never, never really had any issues with loss of reagent quality going through these pumps. Um, they're actually quite robust. So I spent probably the next three months doing just general process screening and development um, in EasyMax, but then when it came to process justification, when we're starting to get kind of ramping up um, in anticipation of filing, uh, there's some issues that were brought to my attention because people hadn't used this system before. They weren't necessarily comfortable with it. They didn't know, um, you know, it wasn't on the normal calibration schedule like we had other, other units. So I kind of had to broach um, a, a slew of different uh, groups in order to kind of get buy-in on using this instrument for process justification. And what I had to kind of really show is that it, it was a robust setup, um, that the reaction data versus time was, had value rather than the kind of a, a one at a time, write down the value, look at the reading, write down the value. Um, and then also the data we, we gathered from this um, was you know, kind of a made in a safe environment that we could collect it, store it, and have it for future reference. Um, and I, I, I promised th at the time that the result of, of doing this was going to be a high degree of confidence that the data that I was acquiring um, was going to be valid and accurate, um, but that it was also gonna be consistent. And I'll kind of show here um, why that was the case. Uh, for those of you who have worked in eye control, it's really nice at putting out these, these report formats. Um, and it's, y you can customize these, but uh, it's in a basic form. It's, it's all gonna be in the same layout every time. And if you're gonna get multiple chemists to do this, um, you kind of take some of the individuality out of how we write our experimental procedures. Uh, this is more or less a lot like what you would see like a batch record in our processing plant would look like. 
And what's nice, again, like in a, in a processing sense, it's very step-by-step -step recipe style. Um, anyone should be able to look at this and, and follow it. And this is kind of where people were like, uh, at AbbVie, were like, okay, I, I see the utility and power in this. And when we did need to reference, um, oops, the, uh, the, the reaction trend data is also in here. And we, and we can, you know, my exothermic addition happens pretty early. I, you know, if I wanted to, I can zoom in um, and cut and paste that, that trend data into the report as well. And I, a lot of times I did. Um, but this made verification of the data or interrogation of the data by someone else, we always did like a cross verification, it made it very easy. It, was, it wasn't personalized, it was very um, almost robotic in nature. It's, it's gonna spit out just the key pieces of data, I'll highlight what I want, um, and it made that, that, uh, that flow much, much smoother. So from there, um, I, I talked about this over and over and over um, at various department meetings um, or subgroup meetings or API team meetings, um, but I really wanted to start pushing this. Um, I thought there was a lot of value in it, um, but I wasn't gonna be able to do this alone. So I started eliciting help from colleagues, um, whether we, uh, we had five units at the time, and then there were other people using it for different reasons, um, some engineers, some process chemists, we actually had one in our solid state group as well. But there was a, a lack of sharing, and we had to address that if we wanted to kind of build this program out. Um, so what I really encouraged people to do was to start presenting at group meetings, um, at department meetings, and then we have a lot of um, internal scientific symposia where groups from other parts of the organization, discovery um, or formulation, you know, we all kind of get together. We have a group in, in uh, Germany in Ludwigshafen that does medicinal chemistry. We kind of try to bring them together and say, hey, there's this technology out there that allows us to do our work easily. The next thing that I, I found that was interesting was how do we, we have these units, we had five at the time, how do I get people to use them? And as much as I twist people's arms and, and, and try to convince them that this was a, a powerful tool for their chemistry, um, and they believe me, you know, they, they saw the fundamental science for it, but you'd be surprised, you know, walking from my lab to their lab, maybe 50, 60 feet away, um, became a barrier. Um, and you, the, the proximity has a lot of, um, a lot of uh, relation, there's a lot of relationship between the user base and the proximity. Um, and I didn't really appreciate that because I thought if, if it's a good tool, I'll go to use it no matter where it's at. Um, and that was the one, one of the things that we started to address right away. So we went from five units um, to 11 units. It was a big jump. And there wasn't a lack of volunteers now for instruments. I think they saw the utility, um, but they wanted one either personally or close by. The next thing I noticed <laughs> very quickly, there are a lot of parts. Um, it's like working with Lego, right? There's a very specific type of way they all fit together um, and instructions always aren't included. Um, so, so getting some awareness and getting some uh, kind of hands-on work with the parts was actually really important and also organization of those parts, making sure they, they were there. The last thing you wanted to do is, is say, oh, I love this instrument, I want you to use it, and you go there and there's no ceiling ring. Like, like where is it? And you can't find it. You know, it's in the, in the wash bin or it went off somewhere else. Um, you gotta have the parts there, um, and they gotta be accessible, very visual, and then we, we kind of broke down eventually. We think we had everything in drawers for a while, um, but we eventually made this um, little organizing bin system. It's near it, so it's very visual. They know where exactly where to look for um, to get parts. Oops. The next thing, um, I couldn't be the only subject matter expert, so we really needed to build out individuals that believed in the technology, but were willing to help and teach others. Um, and that's, that's uh, kind of underappreciated because it's not part of our core job responsibility as chemists um, is to adopt or teach new technology. I think it's just kind of a, we expect it to be an osmosis-like effect, um, but a lot of times it really needs to be an active effort. Um, you need to reach out to colleagues um, that either are, are struggling or, or they know they want to use it, but they're a little bit nervous or they, or they don't feel comfortable yet. Um, I needed to build out a group of people um, that had expertise in it that were willing to help others. And, we, and Mike Rosma and I started a, a super user group um, about 2014 that really started to blossom into a group of users that felt comfortable doing that. And, and with that, when you, when you have a group of super users that are intimate with the technology, they know when things start to go wrong. Um, and if you've, if you've ever worked with any of the metal equipment, it's very robust, but things break. Um, and you need to know, you need to recognize when that happens, but also recognize that it needs to get fixed. Um, they don't, it's not something that's simple. It's, I think 
I got comfortable working in, in repairing HPLC, but you, you just can't do that with an Easy Max. You can't just crack it open. Um, it's not really, there's no in, um, intuitiveness to it. Next thing, uh, like any, any kind of software, there's always new versions, there's always updates, there's always bugs. Um, and we have an IT department that is great when you're working with Outlook and Office. Um, because that's what 99.9% .9 of, our, of our business unit uses. Um, everyone has a PC that has Chrome and Office and Word and, and what have you for basic operations. Uh, but our R&D IT is a really small percentage of that. Um, and we really had to, um, I don't wanna say fight, but we really had to learn from them what it took to implement a new software update. It wasn't just like, like at home, you just click, oh, it's updates time. You click it update and it re updates and you're, you're on to the next version. You know, here we have to go through testing and some sort of qualification or, or um, IT integrity. And that wasn't, I, again, I, it's not my wheelhouse and I didn't really appreciate that. I thought it was just as simple as you know, clicking update. Um, but you need to have colleagues in that area that are willing to understand your part of the business um, your part of how it, IT fits into the, your workflow, um, and identifying that wasn't trivial. Um, but if you do that, it's, it's, it makes all the other downstream processes easy. So we've, do, we've done several updates now to either iControl or to our IC data center platform, and it was integral to have someone kind of on the IT inside that understood what we, what we wanted, um, but was also kind of willing to reach out and educate us on the process. Um, the other thing too is what you need when there's, when there's also the updates to the hardware, new pieces of glassware, new pieces of equipment that, that are complementary to the Easy Max, um, getting awareness, but then also being able to help set up other people with equipment that it's non-standard. It's not just your normal click together um, reaction setup. You know, you wanna do a distillation or you wanna do, um, actually we have one that's doing two CSTRs in an Easy Max, um, and that's not trivial to set up either. Uh, the other thing too that I'm, I'm trying to pass off more of the activities to um, is our management of the IC data center activities. So it, this is the, the enterprise platform that manages the data from all these, um, either the PAT or the automated lab reactors. And I, every morning it's like the, like click and open my, it's Internet Explorer, and just pop up the, the dashboard and it kind of shows me the, kind of like a health of, of, of the systems. Um, I get either errors or I get a green light that says everything's good. Um, it's just kind of built into my routine now um, but sometimes errors throw and you gotta manage that. Um, you gotta have someone that's responsible and willing to interrogate the, the error and figure out who is either the responsible party or who is missing out on the data. Um, but it, 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 it does a really good job operating on its own, but you need to kind of have a, um, a user, in this case we have three of us that have a shared email box that throws the errors towards us. We kind of divvy up based on um, our expertise or availability. Um, the last one here, integrating PAT and other data. Um, like I think we mentioned before, you wanna be able to put all the data you can within reason on the same reaction coordinate. You wanna be able to look at your pH, your particle growth, your temperature, your, your dosing of a, of a solution over time um, because that's when things start to really show up. And I think I, I really tried to sell um, some of the, the particle track, the, the FBRM probe um, utilization to some colleagues doing some heterogeneous reactions where things were going in and out of solution. And I kept telling, I kept telling him, and then he put a probe in and he's like, okay, I, I, I don't understand this. You know, I don't, I don't necessarily know what this value means. And then I overlaid it with his reaction profile or his addition rate profile. And he's like, oh my God, like I, I, I see what's happening here now, or at least I know what I need to look at, what area I need to look at or what I can study. Um, and I think that's where, um, you know, the utility of having PAT data overlaid with reaction trend data can be really powerful. Um, but again, I can't do that alone. So uh, we have some specific groups that are able to tackle that. We have some centers, centers of excellence at AbbVie. Um, one is the Center for PAT, and then one's called the CRE, the Center for Reaction Engineering. And this is a group of individuals that is highly focused on uh, in-depth analysis of a reaction. Um, they're not there to help you screen. Um, you've identified a set of conditions that you would kind of define as nominal and you want to really dive in and understand what's going on. And, and these are the groups that we solicit support from. Um, on top of that, I've worked with a pair of individuals from um, the center of PAT to set up a fixed setup uh, 
this is a what we call a, a crystallization platform um, where we've got an EasyMax 402. Um, we've got the, the particle track, the, the FBRM. We've got the, the particle view, the PVM. Um, we have our online LC. This is a FlowPro. Um, it does a dissolution and, and sends to an um, a online LC unit. Um, then we've got a, a way to measure pH because that's particularly important for this, um, at least for the initial design setup. There's a, a pH adjustment that um, precipitates the, the product. Um, but what we found here too is that you have a group that supports a platform or supports a particular type of setup, the usage just skyrocketed. Uh, as soon as we had something that was set up, they didn't have to worry about gathering the PAT um, from various parts of the department and, and plugging it in themselves, it was already there. It's not quite walk up, um, and I don't think some of these systems will, will ever really be that way, um, just because it is a little bit cumbersome to understand everything um, from, the very from the very onset, but you have a group that's dedicated to supporting it um, a, it gets run, and B, it stays robust. Um, they, keep, they keep it up, the upkeep, and if something does go wrong, they're the, they're the key contact. Um, but yeah, I think this, we, we put this in a little less than a month ago. Um, I think we've already had like 20 different users come through and, and do crystallization design and study. Um, and the list populated quite quickly once we um, initially did the presentation on this setup. Um, but the other thing, and I, I kind of glossed over it, but I think it's something that as I think about it more, we are moving a little bit away from, but um, it kind of goes also back to lowering the activation energy barrier. We made the, the PAT mobile because um, we the ratio is not one to one. You know, for all of our ALRs, and we probably have half as many PAT equipment. Um, and I don't ever see us getting to a point where it is one to one, um, just because it's not always, um, there's not always value added by sticking a probe in. Um, and we have to identify there's a fit for purpose aspect to the chemistries we do and we thought that mo the mobility of the PAT was really important but what we found is that as you move around the PAT we kind of lose it <laughs> um, it gets tossed in a corner or someone doesn't bring it back um, so we're starting to figure out trying to figure out the best way to manage the mobility of that PAT but still to keep the utilization up um, this is just a snapshot of our 2018 um, IC data center data uh, this is this is actually the key slide I used um, actually, my colleague Steve Doherty used um, to an uh, executive management team to justify why we wanted to buy more units. Um, and this is, this is really where uh, it's high level enough, it's not too in depth, but it allows us to capture what we have in these top two boxes here, what we've done, how it breaks down, but really you know, the, the value in my mind isn't necessarily always the hours of experimentation or the data. You know, they're, they're nice big numbers and, and management likes to see trends with large numbers. Um, but the, the number of users we have and the number of departments, um, we've, we've got engineering, solid state, we have actually analytical chemists, PAT chemists, um, organic chemists, um, our S&T colleagues, so they do like the life cycle management when something's already commercialized. Um, there's a lot of input and this is where we get a lot of our um, great cross collaboration, you know, groups coming together, using the same platform, we have the same types of data sets, and then we can really start to get a better understanding of the process, um, or at least start to hone in on um, what technology is needed to push a process forward. That doesn't stop there. Um, with each purchase of a, of a unit, whether it's an EasyMax or an IR, um, Mettler does great on-site training, and it's really great for, for new clients if you haven't been exposed to it, um, I, I do recommend it. But uh, what we've also learned is that doing like in interdepartment or, or intercompany presentations or like kind of lessons learned or seminars on just general education has been really powerful because we're able to kind of focus it down on where are our needs this time, um, what are the problems we're having or, or how do we address the, the chemistries we have at that point in time. Um, so in 2000 or late last fall, um, I kind of did like an Easy Max 101. Um, this was a great way for me to kind of measure the overall um, uptake of users who have never seen using EasyMax. I, you know, I look at the IC data center, I see the names of the same kind of people using it over and over. Um, but we brought new people in, and I was able to see, okay, these people came to my seminar. When's the next time they're going to use an EasyMax? And you know, at some point, I did see a small uptick in, in new users, which is great. Um, but I, I had to go to the, the users that didn't use it and kind of ask them why didn't you use it. Um, and it came down to the fact that they still didn't feel quite comfortable 
putting together a new setup. Everyone was really comfortable with a round bottom flap. It's been around for, for eons. I mean, it's, or, even a, or even a glass reactor. Um, it, there's some sort of level of comfort. There's less parts. It just seems simple. You know, we don't involve like a kind of a, a box that you know, can't really see the inside. Um, but when I did a hands-on training, it was phenomenal, the uptick I saw in usage. Every one of those users I did a hands-on training with immediately started using the instrument. Um, and it didn't have to be proximal at that point. Like they just needed to be comfortable using it. Um, and that really did have the most impact when we saw uh, utilization come up. Last thing, how do you get buy-in from both sides? And the and way we started to do this initially was kind of a grassroots movement. Um, it was really myself, Mike Rosma, another engineer we had at the time, um, just kind of word of mouth from department meetings, really trying to get people excited about using this. Um, but what it really took is over the years, we developed um, good science, and good science sells itself, really. Um, and we got to a point where we really need some buy-in from the top, because the, you know, the metaller, metaller equipment is not cheap. Um, we, we needed some buy-in. We needed some buy-in, not just from my manager or his manager, um, but eventually we went to our VP of development. Um, and at the time, um, Xu Hong, she, she saw the value in it. And she started to say, okay, let, let's strategically start investing in this. But if I give you this, I need to see a return. <laughs> um, and that's where the back and forth between getting buy-in is really important. You, you've, they're gonna give you the resources, you can do good science, but they gotta see the return. And it, it's, it's not, it wasn't easy for me to, you know, I, I feel really low on the pecking order going to my VP asking for, um, you know, some resources, both monetary and personnel. And eventually it culminated this year, um, Shalindra, the new VP, with starting the new automation initiative. So we've been given a, a large amount of time, um, both in personnel, but also in, in monetary resources to pursue this new technology. So by no means is this the best way to do this. Um, and I won't claim to know all the ins and outs of how it all took place. I know my you know, story with this was very much a love and sometimes hate um, with, with trying to get people to understand the utility of this. Um, but the, there's one thing I wanna really underpin here is that it's a lot of little efforts. And it took me probably five years for this to come to the point where it is now. Um, but now my goal is that by, by front loading this so much, it kind of takes off on its own. Um, that, that the number of units we have now at the end of this year will probably be around low 30s, um, which gives us probably about, and the process chemistry group gives us about like a two chemists per DZ max, which actually works out almost perfectly because there's two cells in each one. So almost everyone can have their own cell. Uh, but the other thing too is, is as you, um, if you wanna sell a new technology, it's, it's, it's gotta be based in good, doing good science. Um, and I, I really think that's, should be the, uh, I, I believe that's the foundation of all of our industries. Um, if, we, if we do good science, um, it kind of sells itself, um, and everything just seems to be easier after that. Uh, with that, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank many of the individuals that are part of the automation team. Um, specifically, I'd like to thank Nathan Bennett. Um, he kind of helped me organize some of these slides and do some of the data crunching from IC Data Center. Um, and I talked about uh, Mike Rosma. Um, he was kind of a, a great mentor early on and kind of really encouraged me to, to keep pushing this. Um, especially it, where I kind of came in, uh, technology was not, you know, I'm, I'm a process chemist, I'm, I'm, I'm more evaluated on my chemistry that I do, um, but, but I kept pushing the technology and it was, it was kind of a thumbs up, you're doing some cool stuff, but really it's the chemistry they were focused on and to the point now where I spend 50% of my time on chemistry and 50% of my time supporting and pushing the automation initiative. So it's, it's come a long way and uh, I, I thank Mike a lot for that. I'd like to also thank some of the process chemists from the Lucapavir um, group, especially Russ Sink, who uh, was a great leader and, and can also help me refine some of these slides. And I'd like to thank you for your guys' attention and I'd be happy to answer any questions.